before, stuck, fearful, confused, hiding. An artist sits down to create. We don't need to know what she's going to make, we just know that the process of creating has started. A bird flies in the window, clutching a piece of paper in its claws. I know, birds don't fly into our homes very often and they never show up gripping a piece of paper. Be patient and you'll see where this is going. It's an owl. Who are you? The artist asks. I never had an owl fly into my house before. I'm your muse, said the owl. Convenient, said the artist. I'm ready to make something, but I don't know where to start. The owl says, I'm glad you asked. Here are 12 ideas. He releases the paper and it drifts to the floor. The artist retrieves it. It's a list of potential projects. Thanks, the artist says. There are hundreds more where those came from. You'll never lack for ideas for projects. I will always be here to supply more. Which one should I pick? The top one. Start there and see what happens. The artist nods, smiles to herself, and readies her tools to start. Don't forget, I'm always here. All you have to do is ask. The owl turns and flies out the window. Suddenly, a small creature appears. He's wearing an elfin hat and has a huge tool belt strapped to his waist. Who are you? He asks the artist, eyes wide. I'm your inner maker, replies the elf. I'm the part of you that knows how to make what you're about to create. I'm your education, experience, and talent rolled into a compact, competent package. You're just in time, says the artist. I was just getting started. Let's take a look, said the maker. He jumps onto the back of the chair where the artist is sitting and begins giving advice about where to start. As the artist picks up her tools to begin, the room suddenly grows colder. What's this, she wonders, looking over her shoulder. She feels slimy tentacles wrapping themselves around her wrists. As she turns to see what's happening, her wrists are already bound tightly together by the tentacles of a jellyfish. Who the heck are you, demands the artist. Unwrap my wrists. I'm your inner jellyfish, says the jellyfish. What the hell, the artist exclaims. I'm the part of you that keeps you from starting to create anything. I know you've got the ideas and the knowledge and the ability to make your next project, but don't you have laundry to do? What about the dishes in the sink? And the car needs washing, and so does the dog and the cat and the goldfish. Plus, there's the vacuuming, and you haven't paid the bills yet. You also need to mow the lawn, weed the garden, return that call to your mother, write that proposal, take a shower, shave your legs and your face, wash your hair, and blow it dry this time, for God's sake. As the jellyfish natters on and on, the artist realizes that the tentacles, now wrapped around her forearms, are beginning to sting. As the jellyfish rattles off more and more tasks that need to be done, people to be called, bills to be paid, the venom penetrates her body, spreading a sticky paralysis. She wants to stand up and go put that load of laundry into the washing machine, but she feels exhausted and lethargic. Maybe I'll start the creative project tomorrow, she thinks, as her eyes begin to close. Just as she's about to succumb, she sees the project list that the muse left for her. A spark of anger flashes in her brain and she stands up. Get out of here, she yells, waving her arms. The jellyfish tentacles release and suddenly the artist is free. I'll be back, the jellyfish promises. Don't forget about the laundry. It drifts out the open window. The artist sits down, picks up her tools, and with renewed resolve, begins to create. The process unfolds for her and she finishes the project. There, she says as she cleans her tools, I finished. As she gazes at her work, she hears pounding. She turns to see a giant gavel has entered the room and is hammering everything it sees. No, 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 it yells. That's simply not good enough. You need to go back and fix it. 
You think you're so creative, but you're a fraud. Look at that thing you made. You made better work than this in sixth grade. The pounding continues. The artist slumps in her chair. I'm afraid to ask, who are you? I'm the judge. I'm the part of you that knows you're an imposter. You might be able to keep this information from other people, but you can't hide it from me. Your work stinks. You're a poser. You'll never be good enough. The artist slumps further in her chair. You're right. I am an imposter. I'll never be good enough. Just like my high school art teacher said. I'm glad you agree, blasts the judge. Give up now. As tears drip from the artist's closed eyes, she remembers the jellyfish. Wait a minute. That jellyfish was wrong. Maybe this judge is too. She gets out of her chair and walks over to stand in front of the judge. Who are you anyway, she yells. Go away. The judge blinks in surprise. Really? Oh, okay, I'll go. But as it floats out the open window, these words drift back into the room. Your high school art teacher was right. Weird, says the artist. She shakes her head to dispel the judge's words and returns to look at what she made. Not bad, she says. I, I need to show it to some people to see what they think. The open window slams closed. The door to her studio shuts with a bang. She hears the deadbolt lock. Then a voice pipes up. You're not leaving this room until you promise not to show your work to anyone. A giant skeleton key has locked the studio door and appears to be the origin of the voice. This is like the Dickens novel, A Christmas Carol, except most of the spirits visiting me are malicious. Who are you? The artist asks, weariness in her voice. I'm the jailer. I keep you and your work hidden so no one can see it. Why would you do that? Think about it. What happens when you show your work? Two things, criticism or silence. Remember how criticism feels? Remember how bad silence feels? You want to experience those feelings again? I don't think so. The artist sighs. It's not always like that. Sometimes people appreciate what I make. You can't risk it, it's too painful. The artist slips to the floor in despair. She overcame the jellyfish's resistance and the judge's judgment, but the jailer was right. Rejection and silence were too painful to face. Suddenly, the artist hears trumpets in the distance. The window flies open again, an old woman floats into the room. The artist can barely raise her head, but she asks, who are you? Get off the floor and I'll tell you, the old woman says. The artist groans as she pulls herself into her chair. Okay, I'm listening. I'm your mentor, says the old woman. The artist sits up and cocks her head. My what? Your mentor, silly. The old woman pulls up a chair next to the artist and reaches to hold the artist's hands. I'm the part of you that is connected to your creativity, connected to the flow of ideas, to other artists, to the planet. I'm the mystical part of you that helps you remember who you are, helps you remember how important your art is and how important your contribution to the world is. I'm the part of you who knows how to ignore all the reactions to your art except your own, the only one that matters. The artist starts to weep. You're a part of me? Absolutely, says the old woman. You see and hear me, right? The artist nods. Good, let's take a look at what you made. Their heads lean together as the artist and the mentor turn to the work. Did you recognize yourself in this not a total fairy tale? Maybe you haven't called the feeling of needing to clean the house or wash the car instead of starting on your art, your inner jellyfish. But does the description sound familiar? Did you recognize the voice of your personal judge commenting on the futility and insignificance of everything you make? Could you relate to the fear of being seen? 
the reason your inner jailer tries to make sure you stay hidden? And have you recognized your inner muse bringing you endless ideas for new projects? Or your inner maker who knows how to make them and your mentor knowing what you're up to in the world? If so, you are in the right place. You are an artist and your work needs to get into the world. You deserve to make money and joy with your art. Resistance and the inner critic and fear of visibility are so painful. And there's a lot of literature, books, webinars, seminars about how to combat those things. And they're all super serious. I thought it would be easier to actually turn and look at them if they were like in a fairy tale, like, a, like cartoon characters. And that they wouldn't seem quite so scary. And that because as I go on in the book, you end up working, having conversations with these characters. And if they're not as scary, it seems like they're more approachable. I was brainstorming with my book coach, Michelle Radonsky. We were trying to we figure out names that, well, so first the jellyfish. The thing about the jellyfish is that it paralyzes its prey. And so what I say in the book, if the jellyfish paralyzes its prey, you are its prey. So that made sense. And then once, and then the judge for the inner critic, because everybody calls it the judge, that was an easy one. And it happened to be alliterative with the jellyfish. And then the jailer, I was thinking, okay, if you have fear of visibility, you keep yourself locked in a closet or locked in your studio or locked in your office. And the thing that would do that would be a, a key that would lock everything. So and I was really lucky that they all start with J. Mm -hmm. And I call all three of those things the safety squad. It looks like they're working against you, but they're actually trying in a very outmoded way to keep you safe. These parts of ourselves were born when we were very young. They, because everybody, every creative person, especially has experienced a lot of trauma and criticism around their art, no matter what your art is, that's happened to you. Every creative I've ever worked with has experienced trauma around their art. Criticism from people that matter to them, criticism from peers, misunderstanding, trying to talk you out of it. Oh my God, you can't make any money as an artist and aren't you gonna starve? You know, all that stuff. And so of course we have these parts inside us that wanna keep us safe and want to make sure all of our loved ones still love us. And so it's the way, sort of brute force way to do that is just don't show your art. Like everybody has had, I think every creative has had that experience where somehow a an idea comes out of the blue. And it made sense to me to make that an owl because owls are supposed to be wise. And just the whole freedom of birds in general just made sense to me that it should be, that the muse should be, to be an owl. And then the maker, I just, I don't know why, but the, I got an idea from my muse that the maker should be like a little elf, like Santa's elf or, you know, an elf that's got a tool, <laughs> like a tool bag and yeah. all that stuff. And then the mentor, being an old woman, I really love that idea. Lots of times old people <laughs> like myself <laughs> are discounted. But when you think about a lot of times People with the most wisdom have lived the longest. So that's, that's why I ended up making the mentor an old woman.
I actually have conversations with my mentor, also written ones, which is something I talk about in the book. For some reason, I'm able to access a part of me that knows things that sometimes I can't access without doing a conscious written conversation. So the reason I did that is because of the way the English language works or has often worked that in the olden days, you know, 20 minutes ago, he would refer to globally to women and men. And I just thought, you know, just maybe in the last 10 years, people have started using her instead of him for everything. And it just kind of wakes me up and makes me realize, oh, I'm included in this. So that's why I did a her.